Welcome to session seven of UGBS 301. In the previous session, we looked at probability distributions for the discrete dis random variables and also for the continuous random variable. In this session, we will take a look at sampling distributions. You take an introduction view to the theory of sampling, which is used in place of complete enumeration whenever there is a need to learn something about the larger population. And this is mostly done to reduce cost, save time, among other reasons. This session, we shall go through the mathematics of sampling and provide ways to make inferences using the sample data. At the end of this session, you should be able to understand what sampling distributions are, what sampling errors are, and you'll be able to describe sampling distribution of the mean, describe sampling distribution of a proportion, and calculate probabilities using sampling distribution and discuss sampling from finite populations. So, we know a lot of sam about sampling. We do sample in our daily activities, and we realize that these sample statistics are used to estimate population parameters. For example, the sample mean is an estimation of the population mean mu. And the problem with sampling is that different samples will provide different estimates of the population parameter. And sample results have potential variability, that is sampling error do exist. Therefore, although you want to save time, you want to save cost, among other reasons, we want to consider sampling. But we need to be careful as to the kind of sampling we choose. And we always make the statement that our sample should be a representative of our population so that we don't get too much error and whatever value or whatever estimated value we get from the sample, we can depend on its level of accuracy. So given the population mean, the population mean is given as the sum of all the possible values within the population divided by the population parameter. Also, we know that sample mean is also the sum of all possible values within the sample divided by the sample size. And then we have mu being the population mean, x bar being the sample mean, x being the values in the population or the values in the sample, big N being the population size, and then small n being the sample size. Now we take a question. The table below lists the number of projects undertaken by a certain company and associated project size. So we have complex 1, 2, complex 12, and each of them have an associated project size. Now, the population mean for this is just a summation of all the various values divided by the population size, which is 12. And hence, the population mean size would be 158,971.7 square feet. Now, assuming we take a sample out of this population, let's say a sample of size 5, to determine the population, to, to give an estimate of the population mean. Then it means that we selected 202,300, that is um, complex 2. We also selected complex 3, which is 78,600. We selected complex 6, which is 88,200. And then we selected complex 10, whose size is 303,800. Then we selected complex 12, whose size is 456,900. Now, these complexes are selected to give us an estimate of the overall mean for the 12 complexes. And we have a sum of 829,800 plus a sample mean of 165,960. Now, you could see perfectly that 
given the population mean and then the sample mean, there are differences. Therefore, there is some level of error in here. So, sampling error is therefore the difference between a value computed from a sample, that is a sample statistic, and then the corresponding value computed from a population, which in this case is the population parameter. So sampling error is x bar minus mu. In other words, sampling error is the sample statistic minus the population parameter. So from the previous example, we realized that our sampling error will be the value of the sample mean, which is 165,960, minus the value from the population mean, which is 158,971.7. That is, we have an error value of 6,988.33. We take another example. If the population mean is mu equals 99.5 degrees, and a sample of n equals to five temperatures yield a sample mean of x bar equals 99.2 degrees, then what is the value of the sampling error? The sampling error is computed by the, taking the difference between the population parameter and the sample statistic. Therefore, we have x bar, which is 99.2, minus mu, which is 99.5, and that gives us negative 0 0.3 degrees. So the value of the error is 0 0.3 degrees. Another question in terms of sampling error. We have a population that has a mean of 125, given that a random sample of eight items from the population results in the values 103, 123, 99, 107, 121, 100, 199, what is the sampling error for the sample? So what we can do here is put together all these values and find the mean. When you are done with finding the sample mean, you take the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, and this will give you the sampling error. Indeed, we believe that different samples will yield different values for the statistics. Example, the mean, and therefore, will yield different sampling errors. The sampling error may also be positive or negative, depending on whether x bar is greater than mu or x bar is less than mu. We also believe that as the sample size increases, the level of error reduces. Let's take an example. Given that we have a population value, you realize that if I select sample one, sample five, and sample nine, we have a mean of 64.37. If I select sample 8, 12, and then 3, we also have a different mean values. If our third sample also contains different set of numbers, as in number 10, number 7, and number 4, you also have a different mean values. Now, this tells us that different samples will yield different values for the statistics, because we chose different samples in here from sample 1 to sample 4, and we have different mean values. Therefore, this can give us a sampling distribution, which is actually a distribution of all the possible values of a statistic given the size sample selected from a population. For example, since we have every sample having a mean and a standard deviation, we could construct a distribution for all the means of all possible samples that can be taken from the population. And this is the same for the standard deviation. We believe, therefore, in this theorem, that if a population is normally distributed or normally distributed with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, then the sampling distribution of the sample mean x bar is also normally distributed, this time with a mean mu 
and a standard deviation, also called a standard error, of sigma divided by the square root of n. Therefore, in computing its corresponding z value, we realize that z will now be x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. This is more like the standardization we did when we were looking at the normal distribution, which was x minus mu over sigma. But this time, because we are looking at the distribution of the sample mean, we say that the sampling distribution gives us x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. And in this case, x bar is the sample mean, mu is the population mean, n gives us the sample size, and then sigma gives us the population standard deviation. This holds given that our population is normally distributed. What if the population is not normally distributed? Then we can apply what we call the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem states that even if the population is not normal, sample means from the population will be approximately normal as long as the sample size is large enough. And therefore, the sampling distribution would have a mean of mu and a standard error of sigma divided by the square root of n. This is to say that no matter the distribution of the population, whether binomial, whether Poisson, whether hypergeometric, even if it is not normally distributed, sample means for the population will be approximately normal as long as our sample size is large enough. Therefore, the blue colored shape, we could see that it is skewed to the left. The blue colored curve, you realize it is skewed, and you see that it will transform into the red colored curve, which is approximately normal if the sample size would increase. So from the central limit theorem, we say that as the sample size gets large enough, the sampling distribution becomes almost normal regardless of the shape of the population. One basic question that arises from this is, how large is large enough? Well, for most distributions, we believe that when n, or the sample size, is greater than 30, we'll give a sampling distribution that is nearly normal. For a fairly symmetric distribution, we expect that the sample size is 15. For normal population distributions, the sampling distribution of the mean is always normally distributed, regardless the sample size. Let's take an example. Suppose that a population has a mean of mu equals to 8 and a standard deviation of sigma equals to 3. And suppose that a random sample of size n equals to 36 is selected. What is the probability that the sample mean is between 7.8 and 8.2? Even if the population is not normally distributed, as is given in the case here because we didn't state it, we can use the central limit theorem to evaluate this probability. So, since n is greater than 30, you realize that the sample distribution is approximately normal with a mean mu equals to 8, and we have a standard deviation, which is actually 3 divided by the square root of 36. Because we realized that our question stated that our mean was 8, and then our standard deviation was 3. So going through the process of standardization and solving, we have that the probability that x bar, which is the sample mean, lying between 7.8 and 8.2, will be that when we standardize the first part, we have 7.8 minus 8 divided by 3 over the square root of the sample size, which is 36. Then the second part is 8.2 minus 8 divided by 3 
over the square root of 36. Now this gives us negative 0 0.4 for the first part and then 0 0.4 for the second part. So our normal distribution, which was x bar, and we are being asked to find the probability that x bar lies between 7.8 and 8.2, has been converted into a standard normal distribution, z, which now is lying between negative 0 0.4 and 0 0.4. So our probability is therefore 0 0.3108 which was computed by finding the difference between the probability that z is less than 0 0.4 and the probability that z is less than negative 0 0.4, giving us 0 0.3108. We have another example. Suppose that a population is known to be normally distributed with mean mu equals to 2,000 and standard deviation equals to 230. Given that a sample of size 8 is selected, calculate the probability that the sample mean will exceed 2100. Now over here you realize that our population is normally distributed and therefore regardless of the sample, we believe that our sample mean would also be normally distributed. So, in finding the probability that the sample mean is actually greater than 2,100 is the same as 1 minus the probability that our sample mean will be less than or equal to 2,100. Since we mentioned that our normal distribution tables evaluate distributions on the, from the left of Z, we have to transform it to this point so that we can easily evaluate it using our normal distribution tables. Now going through the process of standardization, we have x bar minus mu divided by sigma over square root of n, therefore giving us 2,100 minus 2,000 over 230, which is the population standard deviation divided by the sample size, which is 8. And that gives us a value of 1.23. Therefore, probability that x bar greater than 2,100 is the same as the probability that x bar is less than or equal to 2,100, which is also the same as 1 minus the probability that z is less or equal to 1.23. Now that we can read from the table, we evaluate this probability from the table and realize that gives us 0 0.8907. Taking this away from 1, we have that the probability that x is greater than 2,100 is 0 0.1093. In other words, we have about a 10% chance that our random variable, the sample mean x, will be greater than 2,100. Let's consider a normal distribution with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 0 0.9. You should be able to calculate the probability that x bar is greater than 36 for each of the following sample sizes. When n is equal to 1, when n is equal to 16, and then when n is equal to 25. Now, given that the sample size, our population is normally distributed, our sample would our collection of samples would also be normally distributed irrespective of the size of the samples. Let's take a more practical example. The branch manager of United Savings and Loans in Seaside, Virginia, has worked with her employees in an effort to reduce the waiting time for customers at the bank. Recently, she and the team concluded that the average waiting time is now down to 3.5 minutes with a standard deviation equal to 1.0 minutes. However, before making a statement at the manager's meeting, this branch manager wanted to double check that the process was working as thought. To make this check, she randomly sampled 25 customers and recorded the time they had to wait. 
she discovered that the mean waiting time for this sample of customers was 4.2 minutes. And based on the team's claims about waiting time, what is the probability that the sample mean of n equals to 25 people would be as large or larger than 4.2 minutes? What then should the manager conclude based on this data? So, we have a population mean of 3.5 minutes, then a standard deviation of one minute. We have a sample mean of 4.2 minutes based on a sample of 25. This information can be obtained from the question. As you can see, we have the population standard deviation of 1.0 minutes, and then the population mean, which was the average waiting time being 3.5 minutes. Then the sample is giving us 4.2 minutes. Our question, therefore, is what is the probability that a sample mean of n equals to 25 people will be larger than 4.2 minutes? Therefore, we are finding the probability that x bar is greater than or equal to 4.2 minutes. And it's the same as 1 minus probability that x is less than 4.2 minutes. Now you realize that we've been toggling between less than or equal to and less than for this continuous distribution. Actually, in a continuous distribution, whether less than or less than or equal to, they are the same. And whether greater than or greater than or equal to, they are the same, unlike the situation with a discrete random variable. Therefore, standardizing our z will be x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. That gives us 4.2 minus 3.5 divided by 1 over the square root of 25. That gives us 3.5. So we shall read this 3.5 from the standard normal distribution table. From the table, you realize that the probability that x greater than or equal to 4.2, the same as the probability 1 minus the probability that x is less than 4.2, which is also translated as 1 minus the probability that z is less than 3.5. And this actually gives us this probability is almost 1. In fact, if you read it from the table, or you read it using Excel or any computer-generated software, you realize that this probability will be about 0 0.9999 and so on, and therefore can be rounded over to 1. If you take 1 from it, you realize you are going to get a probability of 0. That is, it is almost sure that the sample mean cannot be larger than 4.2 minutes. There could be, therefore, some credibility to the team's claim, but the manager should perhaps take another sample to confirm this. Also, just as we can use the sample mean to provide a summary about a population, we could also use a sample proportion to provide this, a summary measure regarding a population when the emphasis is on the percentage of the population. Therefore, we are saying that in certain instances, it wouldn't be so ideal to use the mean or the average value to describe the population. But you would have to use a proportion to describe the population. So if p is the proportion of population having some characteristic, then the sample proportion p bar provides an estimate of p. So our sample proportion is giving us p bar equals to x divided by n, which is actually the number of successes in the sample divided by the sample size. If there are two outcomes, then it means that p has a binomial distribution. We can approximate this to a normal distribution if the n or the sample size times the probability of success is greater or equal to 5 
And the sample size times the probability of failure is also greater or equal to 5. Given this, given this assumption, we can have an approximate normal distribution. And the normal distribution will be such that our mean of the proportion will be p, then our standard error will be p into 1 minus p divided by the sample size n, all under the square root sign. Remember that our p is the population proportion. So to standardize, you're also going to have p bar minus p divided by the standard error of p. So you are going to have the sample proportion minus the population proportion divided by the standard error, which is given as the square root of p into 1 minus p divided by the standard, the sample size n. Let's take an example. If the true proportion of voters who support proposition A is p equals to 0.4, then what is the probability that a sample of size 200 yields a sample proportion, a sample proportion between 0.4 and 0.45? All we are saying is that if you have that the true proportion of voters who support a certain pro proposition is about 40%, then what's the probability that in a sample of 200 voters, you're going to get a sample proportion between 40% and 45%. So if P is equal to 0 0.4 and N is 200, what is the probability that P bar lies between 0 0.4 and then 0 0.45? So since NP is actually 80, which is greater than 5, we can approximate this using the normal distribution. So we find our standard error, which is p into 1 minus p over the square root of n, and that gives us 0 0.3464. Next, we would convert our p into a standard normal distribution, and we are going to standardize. So p, minus p, p bar minus p over the standard error for the first one, which is actually 0 0.4 minus 0 0.4 over 0 0.363464. And then we have 0 0.45 minus 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.3464. And the first part gives us a value of 0, and the second part gives us a value of 1.44. Given this, we can read from the table and we will get an area of 0 0.4251. Therefore, the population, the probability that our sample mean or our sample proportion would lie between 0 0.4 and 0 0.45 is 0 0.4251. Another example that you could try your hands on. According to the most recent labor department, 10.5% of engineers, that is mechanical, civil, and industrial engineers, were women. Suppose that a random sample of 50 engineers is selected. How likely is it that this random sample of size 50 engineers would contain eight or more women in this position? How likely is it that a random sample will contain fewer than five women in this position? And if the random sample included 200 engineers, how would this change your answer to part B? You could also try this second example as shown in your screen. And this brings us to the end of session seven. Thank you very much.